So Peregrine, who are we? I'm going to give you this. This is the answer, by the way. This is where we got to. Then I'll get into how did we get here, and what did it take to do it, and what were all the mistakes we made. Uh, we do RF components. We, uh, we have been growing on average around, Dan, 30% a year for the last probably eight or 10 years. Um, and I'm going to go through that, not in dollars, but more in unit volumes, because semiconductor volume drives the semiconductor industry. We have basically, mobile phones is about 75% of our revenue, meaning cell phones. We're in every smartphone manufacturer, we're in all of them, we're every, Apple, Samsung, you name it, we're in it. Uh, and we also have a very large business in, um, I just call it industrial. So it's everything from medical to automotive to test and measurement, uh, public safety radio, cable TV, television sets, if you own anything, 34 inch and above HD TV, you have, a, you have at least one of our chips in there. So we have an enormous uh, number of customers here. And then we have what we call high performance markets, which I've mentioned some of, one of which is the space market, which is, has an incredible, it has a sex appeal to it. It's, it's Star Trek, it's just, it's just really cool. And I'll tell you a story that, that embodies it to me uh, about the coolness of where our chips have actually gone uh, throughout, throughout, the, throughout the solar system. These are our, some of our bigger markets. These are our customers. What you'll notice here is we have the tier one customers not only in all of these markets, but in all of the cell phone markets. And there's a reason for that. One thing Peregrine could absolutely articulate from day one was we were different. We were going to do silicon CMOS, ho-hum, I've heard it, on Sapphire, and a technology rejected by every major semiconductor company in the world over 30 years. RCA, Intel, HP, Motorola, ST, IBM, you name it, they all had a silicon on sapphire program. The reason? The performance. It's just brilliant. You get rid of capacitance and the world gets better. They didn't even think of RF, turns out that's what we used it for. But we actually decided we would do this completely different thing. And the tier one companies are tier one because they lead. And they stay in the lead by looking for new things that keep them in the lead. The followers, and anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur, if the people you're meeting in that opening meeting say, to your question, what do you really need? If they say, I need what I'm getting today only cheaper, close your book, thank them profusely, and get out of the room. You're wasting your time. You do not put 250 or 750 million dollars into a company to help a buyer lower his cost of goods. That's just lunacy. You do it because you convince the company that your capability is going to improve their capability and they're going to win in the market because you're doing something different and they're enough of a leader to take that risk with you. So. These are all of the top companies in these markets, including in, in, in our handset market, and that's why. They liked the fact that we could clearly articulate how different we were. This is ultimately the measure of success in any semiconductor industry uh, company. We here just last quarter shipped our two billionth chip. We ship those chips today at about a 0.1 part per million field failure rate. In other words, we ship 10 million chips and we get one back. And about half of those that come back were misused by the customer. We just say we can't confirm the error. We don't tell them that they dropped it or they ESD'd it or whatever they actually did to it. Uh, we get them back with holes drilled in them and they say, we don't know why this chip isn't working. <laughs> really? Did you uh, look at it? You might want to find the guy with the uh, rogue drill. So that's two billion units. This is one of the most out-of-body experiences for me to say that, to ship two billion of something to it with the complexity of what we do to the standards that a farmer can't live up to. I guarantee you there's no farmer in the world that can ship 10 million soybeans and guarantee only one of them has a mark on it. Or 10 million ears of coin, corn that doesn't have one of the kernels missing. Because to our standards, that isn't a good ear of corn. So the standards to which the semiconductor industry is held is just by far the greatest in the world. 
man makes semiconductors better than anything else on the planet. Bill Gates or Microsoft launches a brand new software system and they admit there's 50,000 bugs in it. Right? And you know they're lying. <laughs> you know there's 250,000 in there. They just don't know about 200 of them. I thought it was only a factor of pi. Yeah, uh, pi, you're right. Thank you. It's 157.2. I should have. Uh, that, I'm going to use that. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll quote it. Huh. But what you notice here, this is on a linear scale. I'm going to show you it later on a different scale. But what you see on this chart is actually, in my opinion, the only valid measure of a successful entrepreneur, and that is exponential growth. Why? Because you grow in proportion to how much you have today. That says your customers like what you're doing and they put you in more products. Their competitors see what they're doing and they have to have your products. If you're stable and steady, you're either a mature industry, meaning you're well out of the, out of the ad, uh, entrepreneurial phase, or you're a cottage industry. I make the most beautiful quilts in the world and I have enough time to do two of them a year. That is fine, but it isn't an entrepreneurial experience. It isn't capable of undertaking exponential growth until you say, you know what, I'm going to go make these in China, sell them on the internet, turn it into a company, and buy the big boat or whatever.